from Bromyard Folk Festival in Herefordshire in England, uh, quite near where Mike Rust lives, actually, who does the world storytelling, worldwide story round, except he won't be this this week, and I'll talk about that later. Um, and we have as our guest tonight for the children's stories uh, the amazing all the way from Canada, wherever you're listening in the world, Norman Perrett. So please, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of the summer company, please put your hands together and welcome Norman Perrin. Over to you, Norman. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, after an introduction like that, John, I feel I should be jumping through hoops and on a trapeze. Um, so, but I'll try, I will be doing it with stories and leaping through a few hoops that way. Now, before I start, I want to, you said I am from Toronto, Canada, and it is our tradition here to start storytellings uh, with what's called a land acknowledgement. The land acknowledgement uh, honors the people who came here first and who told the first stories on this land because we are merely, we are continuers of that story. And this is the land of the uh, um, dish with uh, one spoon, the land of the Hudasani, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, who have told stories here before and who welcomed the settlers to uh, share their stories, the land in mutual respect and caretaking. And they also told each other stories. And so I want to pass on a few of those tales to you. And um, well, yeah, <laughs> yes, there is uh, all beards. And uh, here we go. Well, the first story um, comes from the uh, goes from the um, the people of the uh, Abenaki who are related to the Anishinaabe here uh, on Ontario. Now, Guskabi, Guskabi was a young man. He has lived for many years with his grandmother, Woodchuck. And grandmother Woodchuck took care of him because, well, Guskabi sometimes made a few mistakes, sometimes made a lot. But there was always his grandmother there to help him out. Now, one day, Guskabi picked up his bow and his arrows, and he went out to go hunting. Hunting's hard work. And he saw a deer, and he crept carefully and quietly, and then he lifted up his arrow and his bow, and then without thinking, he stepped on a little twig. And the deer heard, looked, and ran. So Guskabi didn't catch anything that day, and it had been so hard. So he went back to his grandmother, Woodchuck, and he said, Grandmother, it is so hard to hunt. Why is it that the deer are so fast and have such good ears? Why aren't they slow and stupid so I can catch them and bring you food and fur? Oh, Oh, said Grandmother Woodchuck, my grandson, this is a good thing that the animals are swift and strong, because then you will become swift and strong too, and clever. If you need to catch an animal, you must be smarter than they are. Very well, said Grandma, said Guskabi. If I'm going to be clever, I'd better think a bit. And he went and sat in a corner, and he thought, and he thought. And he thought, he thought for a long time, but then he got an idea. Aha, he said, grandmother. Yes, grandson. I've gotten an idea. That's good. What is your idea? Well, grandmother, um, I, I have trouble carrying the animals back because I've got nothing to carry them in. Can you make me a bag? So a game bag? so that I can carry the animals back? Oh, you already have a good thought, said Grandmother Woodchuck. And she began to work on making a beautiful bag. Now, what the uh, Abenaki people did was that they plucked the fur off of hides 
and then they spun the fur into thread and then they wove the thread into a cloth and they cut and sewed that cloth into the bags and so grandmother woodchuck took the hide of a deer and she pluck 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 plucked all the fur off and then she spun it into beautiful fine thread and then she wove that thread into cloth she cut and sewed the cloth until she had um, a bag a beautiful bag and Gluskab, he looked inside the bag he looked at grandmother woodchuck and he says grandmother this is a lovely bag but not the one i want very well i'll make you another one and grandmother woodchuck took the hide of a moose you know moose big horns lots of fur she plucked pluck 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 plucked all of the fur off that hide she spun the fur into thread good strong thread and then she wove that thread into cloth good strong cloth and then she cut and sewed a bag and Gluskabi took and handed it to Gluskabi she took he uh, took the bag grandmother this is a beautiful bag but not the one I wanted very well grandmother woodchuck this time took the hide of a bear she plucked all the fur she spun it into thread she wove the thread into cloth and then she cut and sewed the cloth into a bag and gave that to gluskabi and gluskabi took that bag and he looked inside of it and what do you think he said grandmother this is not the bag that I want. Very well, my grandson. What kind of bag do you want? Oh, Grandmother Woodchuck. You know, I really, really want a bag made from the fur of a woodchuck, Grandmother Woodchuck. Oh, and for the longest time, Grandmother Woodchuck looked at her grandson, but she had made a promise. And so she plucked all the fur off of her belly. She took that fur and she spun it in the finest, the strongest of thread. She took that thread and she wove it into cloth that was soft and supple and strong then she cut and sewed a bag and gave that bag to guskabi guskabi took that bag grandmother had decorated it with all kinds of designs made with colored quills for if it was going to be her fur it would be the most magnificent bag that you had ever seen there was animals and there was stars and all sorts of figures upon that bag. And Gluskabi looked inside of that bag and he said, Grandmother, this is the bag I wanted all along. Thank you, Grandmother. And Gluskabi went out with the bag into the forest, thinking to himself, this bag is magic. This bag can hold anything in the world because it was bottomless. I could put all the animals in the world into this bag and it would be as light as a feather. And I know just how I'm going to use this bag. And he went into the middle of the forest. He found a big rock. He climbed up on top of that rock and he said in a loud voice, a very loud voice. It was even louder than the the storyteller. The voice rolled around the world. This is what Guskabi said. My friends, animals of the world i have terrible news come to the clearing by the edge of the great green forest and all of the animals heard and they all came to the rock by the uh, in the great green forest and they all gathered around from the south there came some alligators from the west there came the buffalo from the north there came a polar bear and from the east there came the deer 
And the very last animal to show up was a guinea pig. And they crowded around and he said, Gluskavi, Gluskavi, what news do you have? Terrible news indeed, said uh, Gluskavi. You know what? The world's going to fall apart. It's going to break up into thousands of pieces. We're all going to die. That's terrible, said the animals. Oh, Gluskabi, is there nowhere that we can go, that where we will be safe? Can you tell us, please, oh, wise Gluskabi? Yes, Gluskabi said, there is one safe place. My grandmother made us a special bag that can hold all of you. And inside that bag, you will be safe when the world falls apart. So all of the animals went into the world, the buffalo, the deer, the alligators, polar bears, and the very last one inside the bag was, what was the last animal inside? The guinea pig. Now, Kuskavi tied the bag up tight. He slung it over his shoulder, and it was as light as a feather. They went back proudly back to his grandmother. And grandmother looked up from her work and said, Gluskabi, my grandson, you are back early today. Yes, said Gluskabi, I am back early. That is because the hunting was good. It was very good. Grandmother, the hunting was so good, we will never have to hunt again. Now, when grandmother Woodchuck heard Gluskabi talk that way, in that tone of voice, she knew that he had done something wrong. Yes, grandson, what have you done this time? What do you mean, what have I done this time? I've been very clever, for I have tripped all of the animals of the world into this bag. Whenever we want some food, some meat, some fur, I just reach inside of the bag and pull out what we want. Uh-huh, said Grandmother Woodchuck. Gluskabi, is there any food inside that bag for the animals? No, no. Why should I give them food? They're supposed to feed us. Uh-huh. And is there any air or water inside of those bag for the animals? No. You know what it would be like to try and give water to all the animals of the world? Uh-huh, said Grandmother Woodchuck. Gluskabi, think. What would happen to all of the animals without any air, without any food, without any water? What would happen to them? What do you think would happen to them? They would die. Oh, grandmother. Oh, grandmother, I'm so sorry. When will I ever learn? Sometimes I wonder that myself, said uh, grandmother Woodchuck. But Gluskabi, you know the right thing to do. Yes, grandmother, I know what to do. And Gluskabi took the bag, went into the forest, went to the rock, climbed up in the rock, opened up the bag and called out, all you animals of the world, I have wonderful news. The world did fall apart, but my grandmother made some special glue. And I took all the pieces and I glued the entire world back together again. And all of the animals came out and they looked around at the trees and land and lakes says, oh Gluskabi it's wonderful what you have done it's as if the world had never been broken up at all it was nothing said Gluskabi and for once he was telling the truth and so finally when all the animals had gotten out the alligators and the buffalo and the polar bears and the deer to the east the very last animal to come out of the bag was, what do you think the last animal out of the bag was? The guinea pig. And the guinea pig wandered off into the grass. Guskabi saw it disappear. He picked up the bag and he went back to go hunting. Hunting was such hard, hard and that's the story of Guskabi and the game bag, as I got from Joseph Bruchak's book, The Keepers of the Earth. And so I hope you like that little 
we tell. Now, okay, we have cre the world has been created. There are animals everywhere. And there's different things that happen. But this story is about how the animals, about the, uh, the Bremen town musicians. Now, a long time ago, in a farm in, a, uh, sit in the country of Germany, there was a donkey. And the donkey lived on the farm. And every summer, every spring, he pulled a plow. Every summer, he pulled a big tank full of water to irrigate the crops. And in the fall, and in the fall, the crops would be harvested and loaded up on the wagon. And I want to ask you if you can unmute for a, a, just a moment and uh, tell me what would be put upon that wagon? Because you see, this farm could grow anything. So onions. what was put on the wagon? Onions. There was tons of onions all loaded up. Mike? Wheat. There was wheat pouring like gold from the ground itself. And I've forgotten your name. Um, is it Louis. Judy? That's, that's Louis. 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 Louis, what do you think was growing on that farm? What would you hey, like to Bayou. grow? Hmm? Hey, Bayos. Potatoes. Oh, there hey, were. Bayos. My ears aren't very good. Oh. Okay. Hey. Bales. Hey. Oh, hey, bales. Bales of hay. Oh, hails hail of bales. Hey, no, bales. I have a trouble. Hails of bay. Hey, and hay bales. Of course. Hey, and bales. that fed the donkey, but it was also good to sell in the market. And so that wagon was loaded with bales of hay and of uh, wheat and of... The, The onions. other things. Onions. So the donkey was hitched up to that wagon. And the donkey went to pull. And the wagon didn't move. And he pulled. And the wagon didn't move. There is so much onions. There's so much wheat. There was so much on that wagon, including bales of hay that it just wouldn't move. And the farmer thought, that donkey is getting too old to work. I think I'm going to do is take him down to Bremen town and going to sell him for glue. And the donkey heard this and he says, I don't want to be turned into glue. And the donkey kicked and he kicked and he broke the harness and he went down the road, clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop. And then he stopped. And he thought to himself, I've run away. And here I am in the great wide world. What am I going to do? You know, sometimes when you run off, you have to stop and think for a moment. What am I going to do? The donkey thought, says, well, I'm too old to pull wagons. And let's see. Uh, I could try. No, I, that won't work. I tried that. It hurt. Uh, maybe I know I've got a singing voice the most beautiful voice you've ever heard. And I'm going to down to Bremen town and I'm going to sing my heart out. And the people, they'll give me gold for my beautiful voice. And the donkey took a deep breath and he went, hey -ha. Oh, that's beautiful, said the donkey. And he went down the road singing to himself, I'm going down to Bremen town, my fortune for to find. And if I'm clever and if I'm bold, I'll make a treasure of shining gold. But what he really sounded like, Louis, what did he really sound like? What does the donkey sound like? You're right, he did. And so he went down the road and he came to a dog. The dog was lying in a ditch. And he looked down at the poor little dog and he says, dog, why are you there in a ditch? The dog looked up from the ditch. And he said, it's a sad, sad story I have to tell. For you see, I've gotten old 
My teeth are worn down. I can't chase the robbers and the wolves away from the farm. And the farmer took a stick and he wickedy wackedy he beat me and I had to run away. And here I am in the great wide world and I don't know what I'm going to do. Have you got a singing voice? asked the uh, donkey. And the dog says, why, yes, uh, I certainly do have a singing voice. And the dog jumped up from the ditch, wagged its tail, took a deep breath, and the dog went, Louie, what do you think the dog sounded like? Could you unmute yourself? <laughs> You're right. And the donkey said, that's just what we need for our Bremen Town musicians. And so the dog and the uh, old, the donkey, and the donkey went down the road, quickly clop, clip, clop, singing, We're going down to Bremen Town, our fortune for to find. And if we're clever and if we're bold, we'll find a treasure of shining gold. Well, they really sounded like it was he <laughs> Until they traveled along, until they came to a, a cat. And the cat was sitting on a fence post. And the cat saw the donkey, and the donkey saw the cat. And the donkey asked the cat, oh, cat, oh, beautiful, sweet cat, why are you sitting on that uh, fence post for? And the cat looked at the donkey and said, well, not that it's any of your business. But you see, this morning, I went to pounce on the mouse, and I missed. And the farmer said I was getting too old to catch the mice. The farmer tried to drown me. I kicked and I scratched and I bit and I ran away. And here I am in the great wide world and I don't know what I'm going to do. Have you got a singing voice? Asked the donkey. Of course I've got a singing voice, said the cat. I'm a cat after all. The cat took a deep, deep breath and went, Oh, that's beautiful, said the donkey. A soprano, just what we need for our Bremen Town musicians. And so they went clip clop, clip clop down the road singing, We're going down to Bremen Town, our fortune for to find. And if we're clever and if we're bold, we'll find our treasure of shining gold. But you know what they really sounded like? Yee-haw. <laughs> Until they started coming to the edge of the forest. And when they were coming near the forest, they found a rooster. The rooster was in the middle of the road. Its tail feathers were all dribble drabble in the dust. And the donkey stopped and he said, Oh, poor rooster, why are you there? standing in the road with your tail feathers all dribble drabble in the dust well said the rooster <laughs> uh, it's a sad story i have to tell this morning i was supposed to wake up the farmer as i always have but i i, I lost my voice and i could not crow and the do farmer said he's going to turn me into rooster soup and i don't want to be rooster soup so I ran away, and here I am in the great wide world, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, said the rooster, I uh, said the donkey. Rooster, can you uh, sing a little bit? Yes, said the rooster. I drank some water, I cleared my voice, and now I can sing. I have the most beautiful voice you've ever heard. And the rooster fluffed his feathers, shook his tail feathers, and he began to go, beautiful, said the uh, donkey, just what we made for our Bremen town musicians. And so they went clip-clop, clip-clop down the road into the forest. And the sun went down and it got dark, it got very dark. It got very scary. The animals all huddled together because you see the forest was full of ogres and giants and trolls 
and lots of things with teeth. When suddenly they saw in the darkness a light. And the donkey said, look, there is a light. Where there's a light, there's people. Where there's people, there's food. And I do not know about you, but I'm starving. And so they followed the light and they came to a clearing. And in the clearing was this beautiful house. There was light coming from every window. But what they didn't know was the house of robbers. Robbers who had been robbing people for many, many years. And they were sitting down to their feast of a supper. And the donkey and the animals did not know that. They went up to the door and the donkey was about to knock. And then he said, stop. We are not beggars. We are buskers. And we're going to sing for our supper. We are going to sing our most beautiful song for our supper. And then we shall get the reward we deserve. And I want each one of you to unmute now. I want you to choose a favorite animal, maybe two or three or whatever. And then you are going to, you are now the Bremen Town musicians. And so the donkey counted one, two, three, and he said to everyone, sing, sing at the top of your voice. And they began to go, hee haw, <laughs> <laughs> and inside, <laughs> the robbers heard that beautiful music, and they thought every monster, ogre, and troll was about to knock down their door. And so they ran out. They ran out through the back door. And when I say they ran out through the door, they didn't even bother to open the door. They went straight through. And they disappeared into the darkness and were never seen again. So the donkey listened for a while. It was quiet. And he said, I, I don't hear anybody. Let's go in. And they opened up the door. And there they found the feast that the robbers had been about to eat. And the donkey said, ah, look, they liked our singing. They left this food for us. I'm hungry. And they began to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And, eat. and finally, when they finished eating, so this story could go on, they went exploring and they opened up a door. That door was full of silver coins, but there was nobody there. So they went down, they opened up a second door and it was full of gold coins, but there was nobody there. So they kept on going and they opened up a third door and that room was full full of jewels of all kinds you name it that was in that room and the donkey said there's nobody here either i guess they left all of this treasure for us and so we will keep it we will stay here we'll stay here forever and so the animals went to live in that house Oh, it was a beautiful place to, to live. They uh, created a beautiful garden and uh, they had always some work to do to keep themselves happy and occupied. But in the evening, they would make themselves a bonfire. They would sit around the bonfire, sometimes with guests, and they would sing their favorite song, the song that we, they had sung many times. And this is the song. We're going down to Bremen town, our fortune for to find. For we are clever and we are bold, and we found our treasure of shining gold. And for all I know, they're sitting around to this very day. And may we have their joy and their fortune for ourselves. No. <laughs> now the um
I think it'll take a little bit of a pace change. Once there was a little boy. This story comes from a book called Ten Small Tales by my friend um, Celia Lottridge. And the little boy and his father lived in a house near a river. And what the boy liked to do more than anything else in the world was to get some bait, some worms, a fishing pole, and go down to the river. And what do you think they went and did at the river? Fish? They fished. They fished. It was just sit there. Sometimes all they did was get their hooks wet. But it was the favorite occupation of the little boy. But when they caught a fish, oh, it was tasty fish fries and other things. Now, one day, the little boy went to his dad. Says, Dad, when you're finished the newspaper, can we go fishing? And the father from behind the newspapers, like this, and he said, yeah, yeah, right, uh, we'll go fishing. And so the boy left. The father was doing a crossword puzzle. It was a big, long, hard one. And so the boy came back later and he said, Dad, can we go fishing? Uh-huh, said the father. Uh, I got to finish this crossword puzzle first. And the boy was bored. So what he did, he wandered around and then he remembered what he could do. I, ha, I'm going to play a trick on my father. I'm going to find myself a peanut. And he found the peanut. Because you see, he had a magic trick. And this was the trick. He could hide inside the peanut. And so the boy turned himself very small and he was hiding inside the peanut. Meanwhile, his father finished the uh, crossword puzzle. And then he went looking for the boy. Now he knew the boy liked to go hiding and he knew all the hiding places. So he went from one place to another. But while he was looking for his son and where he was hiding, why the chicken came along. The chicken went bah, 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 peanut and swallowed up the peanut. Now the boy was inside the peanut and the peanut was inside the chicken. And the chicken went buck, 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 and came near the woods. And in the woods, there was a fox. And the fox saw the chicken. And the fox opened wide its jaws and swallowed up the chicken in one gulp. And now the boy was inside the peanut. And the peanut was inside the chicken. And the chicken was inside the fox. And the fox was walking through the forest and met a wolf. And the wolf was hungry. And the wolf, when he saw the fox, opened wide his jaws and swallowed up the fox. And now the boy was inside the peanut. The peanut was inside the chicken. The chicken was inside the fox. The fox was inside the wolf. And the wolf was full. <coughs> and the wolf waddled down to the river to take a drink of water. And the wolf leaned over. His long pink tail went to lap the water. And while the wolf was drinking the water, a huge fish came out of the water, opened up its huge jaws, and swallowed the wolf. And went down under water. And now the boy was inside the peanut. The peanut was inside the chicken. The chicken was inside the fox. The fox was inside the wolf. And the wolf was inside a great big fish. Meanwhile, back at the house, the father had searched everywhere. And he could not find the little boy. So he went and got his fishing pole. He went and got some bait. And he went down to the river, thinking he'll, he'll come down to the river eventually. And so he put some worms on the hook. He took the line and he threw it into the water. And the hook went splash into the water. And suddenly, a huge fish 
<coughs> bit the uh, hook. And the father pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled the fish onto earth. It was a big fish. And the father says, wow, you're pretty fat. You must have been eating something. And so he took and the jaws of the fish and he opened it wide. And looking out from inside the fish was the wolf. And he grabbed hold of the wolf and he pulled out the wolf. And then he opened up the jaws of the wolf. And inside the wolf there was the fox. And he grabbed hold of the fox and he pulled the fox out. And then he says, hmm, people have been eating a lot today. And he grabbed hold of the fox, looked inside the fox, and he saw the chicken. And he reached in, he pulled the chicken out, and the chicken tried to get away, but he held that chicken, he held its beak. He parted the little beak, and inside, what did he see inside the chicken? He saw a peanut. And when he saw the peanut, the little boy jumped out of the peanut back onto warm, dry earth and said, ha, 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 daddy, I almost fooled you. You'll always find me no matter where I go. And the father hugged his son and they went back with the fish, of course. And all of the animals went back to their homes, including the chicken. But that was the last time the little boy ever tried to hide inside a peanut. Because you never know, he might be in that peanut forever. And that's the story of the little boy who hid inside the peanut. Now, the last story I'm going to tell, I know that we're supposed to be doing a full hour. I wasn't too sure if um, you wanted a, a full hour, but I have four stories and one more. So I'm going to do the, uh, the, the fourth story, and then maybe if we have time, the one more, okay? Once at the beginning of the world, when it had just been born, none of the animals had any voices. The donkey couldn't go, hee haw. The chicken couldn't go, cluck, 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 cluck. The cat didn't know how to go, meow. The world was silent. And so the shaper and maker of things said, today I shall give the animals voices. And so the shaper reached, 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 reached high into the sky and pulled down the sound of thunder and reached down, down, down into the waters of the world. And he took the murmurs of the waters. And between thunder and murmurs, he made voices, enough voices for all of the animals of the world. And he put them into a bag and he took the bag into the forest and then he called out to all of the animals all oh, you animals of the world come to the uh clearing of the great green forest for i have wonderful news for you you shall receive your voices your own true voices and the shaper's voice rolled around the world and all of the animals heard and they all came they looked at one another they wondered what voices were and then they saw the bag there was hoots and there was howls and screeches and yowls in that bag and each one of the animals knew that their voice was inside that bag and the shaper called out to the animals my friends, today you shall receive your voices, your own true voices. And if you do not like the voice you get at first, you may trade it for another. But choose well, 
For you see, once the sun sets, once the sun sets below the horizon, you will keep whatever voice you have, and you will have it forever. Choose carefully. Now, the first animal was the dog. And the dog just ran, 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 jumped into the bag, took a voice, put it on, and the dog went quack, 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 quack. That's, that, that, that's not my voice, said the dog. Then try again, said the shaper. And this time the dog put his snout into the bag and he sniffed, because that's how dogs find things. Sniff, sniff, sniff. No, not that one. Sniff, sniff, sniff. No, no, not that one. Sniff, sniff. That's the one I want. And the dog took that voice, took off the other voice, put on his own voice, took a deep breath, and he went. (laughs) That's my voice, said the dog. My own true voice. And so animal after animal got their voices. The birds uh, flew into the bag silent and flew out of the bag singing. And the forest filled with hoots and howls and screeches and yowls until at last there was only two voices left in the bag and two animals. Great big lion and tiny little mouse. Lion was about to pull pull out a large growly voice and Mouse saw that large growly voice and thought, I want that voice for myself. And Mouse ran underneath the lion's tail between his huge paws and leapt up into the air and pulled Lion's voice from his paws and ran off into the forest. And Lion got the last voice inside the bag. Make that mouse give back my voice, squeaked the lion. I'm sorry, said the shaper, I cannot do that. For even though mouse stole your voice, I cannot take it back from him. Lion, you're going to have to go to mouse and get your own voice back. Well, if I don't get my voice back, said the lion, I'm going to kill that mouse. Oh, no, said the shaper, you can't do that. For if you kill the mouse, your voice will die with mouse, and it will die forever. You're going to have to use your brains, lion, and not your strength. Oh, poor lion. He wasn't used to thinking. He'd always growl or put out his claws, and, and people did exactly what he asked them to. And he ran into the forest crying out, Oh, Mouse, 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 please give me back my old voice. But Mouse was hiding underneath a bush. And Mouse saw a lion ran into the forest and disappear into the shadows of the forest. And when lion was gone, Mouse crept out underneath from underneath the bush, and little Mouse took a deep Deep, deep breath, and little mouse went, roar! And all the leaves fell off the tree. They're frightened by the lion's roar. That was fun. Mouse ran from tree to tree to tree, roaring all over the uh, place, and the leaves were falling from the trees all over the place, and that is why in the autumn the leaves fall from the trees, because mouse frightened them a long time ago. Now, that got boring after a while, and so Mouse went into the forest and found Elephant. Ah, going to have some fun with Elephant. The little mouse crept up on Lion's big, 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 big leg, and up onto his broad, broad shoulder, and up behind his tiny little ears. Oh, I have to tell you that in those days, lions had tiny little ears and a short nose, just like me. Or just like Baba C. Uh, (laughs) And little mouse took a deep, deep, deep breath. And right into uh, elephant's tiny ear, he went, roar! And elephant's ears turned into umbrellas. (coughs) And his his, uh, trunk went out 10 feet long. 
and went trumpeting off into the forest. And that is why, to this day, elephants are afraid of mice. Well, roaring is hot and thirsty work. And so Mouse went down to the watering hole to get a drink of water because his throat was a little bit on the scratchy side. And Mouse was just about to jump into the water when the, suddenly a voice behind this very large bush said, Hey, Mouse, you better be careful, Mouse. If you jump in the water and get your voice wet before the sun sets, it'll shrink down to a squeak. And Mouse said, Who's that? That's a friend, said the voice behind that very large bush. Well, thank you, my friend. Thank you. I will do what you say. And Mouse took off Lion's voice and hung it upon that bush where it gleamed golden red in the rays of the setting sun. And Mouse jumped into the water and was swimming and enjoying a cool drink of water when Mouse did not see a big paw reach around. Take that voice. And then put another voice in its place. Suddenly the voice cried out, Mouse, Mouse, look, look, the sun is almost gone. Put your voice on before you lose it forever. And indeed, the sun was just about to disappear. Mouse swam to the shore, ran up to the bush, grabbed hold of the voice, put it on. <sighs> the sun set. Now the animals would keep their voices forever their own true voices mouse went around the bush to find out who his friend was but nobody was there so mouse went on and on into the forest and found giraffe ah said mouse i'm going to have some fun with giraffe and mouse climbed up 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 giraffe's long leg that was a long climb and then little mouse went up, 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 giraffe's long neck. That was an even longer climb. And mouse crept up behind giraffe's lar large ears and took a deep, deep, deep breath and wondered what would giraffe look like with a nose as long as his neck. And he went squeak, squeak, squeak. And when Giraffe got that squeak in his ears, why, he shook his head. And he catapulted Mouse into the air. And there was Mouse flying over the trees. His whiskers were whistling in the wind. His tail was going woof, 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 like a propeller. And he landed splash in the water. Down into the darkness, Mouse went. Mouse would have drowned. Mouse would have died. But a great golden paw reached down into the darkness and lifted little mouse onto warm, dry earth. And who do you think it was? Oh, lion, said Mouse. Oh, lion, my voice is nothing but a squeak. Oh, that's too bad, said lion. You must have gotten your voice wet somehow and it shrank. Well, I kept my voice dry. And I have a magnificent voice. And Lion let out a roar that shook the leaves. The elephant trumpeted. The giraffe ran off into the grass slides. And as for Little Mouse, why, Little Mouse went running into the shadows and the bushes. And has been hiding in the shadows and the bushes ever since, afraid of lions or anything that even looks like a lion. And so, to this day, the animals have their true voices, and may each one of us find our own true voices as the animals did long ago. Thank you. Fantastic, Norman. Well, Mike, did you have something to say there? Because you're muted. Sorry, I was signaling. One more, one more. <laughs> well, do you... 
Yeah. Would you like one more? I'm like, mm, yeah. the, okay. But I uh, guess. Okay, this is you... a short one. It's an origin story. And, I, and you don't have to mute yourself for this one. I want to, in a way, that little red thing with the bar through it um, oh, is kind of, for me, a bit of a barrier. So, Baba, you can unmute yourself. Okay. No, no, Baba no, unmuted. No, no. <laughs> and somehow, though, a muted Baba is a, uh, a strange Baba. You know? Indeed. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I've given one origin, and I've used this, and I'll, this is the story of why there are, is music in the world. <clears throat> Long time ago, again, the world had just been born, but now there was something new. There were people. And where there's people, there's children. And where there's children, why? They're making noise all over the place. And they're playing, and these children were playing by the edge of the forest. They're yelling, tag your it's, and doing all the things that children have done since the beginning of time. But suddenly, they heard a sound. They stopped. They'd never heard that sound before. It, is, it was in the forest, and it sounded just like this. They'd never heard anything like that before. And it was strange and it was f wonderful and a little bit scary. And so they all ran away, all except for one little girl who hid behind a bush. Because you see, curiosity is stronger than fear. And out of the forest, that sound came, came closer and closer. And out of the forest, there came a little old lady. And she had a stick in her mouth. And from that stick came from this came this sound. She cried out, Grandmother, how do you make that sound come from that stick? She stopped and she laughed. She says, Grandchild, <laughs> this sound is called music and this still stick is called a flute. Oh, said the little girl, this music is sweet to my ears. Grandmother, will you teach me how to make this music? And the grandmother did. She showed her how to hold the flute, to cover the holes, to breathe into it. <laughs> Until the little girl had learned everything that the old woman could teach her. And the little girl said, Grandmother, thank you very much for this music, but this is your music. How do I find mine? Oh, that's a very wise question to ask, said the old woman. The way to find your own music is through silence. You must go somewhere where it's quiet. And there where it is quiet, you must listen. And from there, you will find your music, your own true music. So the little girl said, Grandmother, thank you very much. And the old woman made a gift of the flute to the young girl. The young girl took it. She said good goodbye. And the old woman left this story and she walked into another. Yeah. The little girl took the flute and went into the forest. And in the forest, there was a clearing. And in the clearing, there was a green stone and surrounded by lady, pink lady uh, slippers. The little girl sat on that stone. She listened. She listened and she heard the sound of the wind and the leaves. And then she listened some more and she heard a bird. Ah, those are my first two sounds, said the little girl. And then she sat down to listen some more and she had to listen very, very carefully. And this time off in the distance, she heard the sound of water murmuring through some rocks. She listened to that uh, for a moment. She took a breath. <laughs> and 
And for a moment she waited and thought, and then she took a deep, deep breath. She breathed into the flute, and her fingers and her heart wove all those sound of the wind and the birds and the water into music, her own music. She got up from the rock and playing that music, she walked out of the forest, she walked towards her village and playing that music. And the children in the village heard that music coming out of the forest and into their village. And they all hid because it was scary. But then, as I said before, curiosity is stronger than fear and they peeped. What did they see? They saw their friend with a stick in her mouth. And they called out, Sister! Sister, how do you make that sound come from that stick? And she laughed and he said, This is not a stick, it is called a flute. And this sound is called music. Ah, said the children, This music is sweet to our ears. Will you show us how to make this music? She said, Yes, I can do that. If you listen listen carefully and so they must have listened very very carefully because you see when those children grew up they taught music to their children and when those children grew up they taught children their music to the children and then the children of the children of the children went all around the world from the country of Africa where this story comes from and everywhere that people went they brought with them the great gift of music because of long ago, there was a young girl who sat and listened and knew how to listen to the silence. Thank you. All right. <laughs> oh, wow. A great story. Great Fantastic. Story, Norman. It was yeah. phenomenal. That, that's my adaptation of a story that I found and called a book called The Quivering Spear. <clears throat> you wouldn't recognize it. I, I really did do changes to it um it was originally a little boy but uh, somehow a girl came out of the forest I, and I, yeah. so that concludes my storytelling i hope louis you liked it yeah yeah I'm, I'm, I'm still on right well louis John. hello hello I'm sorry I, i've hello, been John. i've been trying to be in 20 places simultaneously just now uh, okay, um, caught some of uh, some of Norman um, set, uh, it and it's been really magnificent. I okay, just got to John. Yeah. I got to go now because I'm in Oakham and I'm doing swimming, so I'm gonna go. Lovely. Enjoy your swim. Enjoy your oh, swim. Fantastic. I will. Enjoy okay. Now next week. Uh, on Friday, we have Donald Nelson from Glasgow. Bye, guys. Bye. bye. Lady okay. Louie, okay. missing you already. Okay, bye. Swim. Have I, a lovely I, I swim. Just, Norman, thank you. Just, Sunday you know. is our worldwide story ground, 6 o'clock. And uh, that's uh, hosted by our Mike that is there with the very special staircase behind him and uh, the, 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 his, his magnificent gothic background. Um, so, uh, so you're all invited to everyone. Everyone in the world is invited. Uh, come in, come in. Everyone in the world is invited to tell stories at the World Storytelling Cafe for our worldwide story round. On Sunday, 6 o'clock UK time, I'll get around to it. Tuesday will be uh, our five o'clock UK time will be our young international tellers. If anyone has a if anyone has a, uh, a, a young teller that would like to come and tell on Tuesday, um, just jo come and join in from anywhere in the world in any language you like. And uh, and Friday and Donald and then 
It just goes on and on and on. The okay. World Storytelling Cafe rolls on and Norman Perrin rolls with it. Uh, so thank you once more. Another big round of applause for Norman Perrin. Norman, you were phenomenal. <laughs> Goodbye, Louis. Goodbye, oh, Mike. God. Goodbye, Bye, Bubba C. Bye, Goodbye, Bye, Norman. Bye. Thank you. To be you. continued. Thanks for Thank listening. Thank you for driving the magic carpet, Ali. Thank you, Dono. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, my friends. Louis, see if, see if you can swim without getting wet. Okay. Stop it, Bubba. Stop it. <laughs> Okay, oh bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, see you, John. Have a good day. Have a good day. day. I, I have to bye head bye. out. <laughs> I actually have a story about swimming without getting wet. Maybe I'll remember to tell it one day. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Later, Louis.